Well, Mike, welcome to um, interest.co.nz. Um, obviously, the float has been uppermost in your mind over the last few months. Um, how did it go? Yeah, I think really well. If you think, how would you measure success? You say, well, were the old shareholders happy with the price that they sold at? And I think they've said publicly that they were. You then think about, did you get, a, from my perspective, a register of new shareholders that represent the sort of diversity you want? And I think we can say yes to that. And then clearly trading in the aftermarket is an important indication. And you know we haven't uh, gone below the price we listed at, and we've gone up a little bit, and that looks like success to me. Pretty dramatic turnaround, because you, you, you really had two years to, to take what was a, a fairly you know, run-of-the-mill um, service station operation and turn it into something. W what was your approach? What were you looking to achieve in that period? Well, I think it's important to go back three years because we bought the company out three years ago. So the first year was all about managing the downside risk of moving away from a global company to being a standalone Kiwi company. So that's what we call transition. And at the end of that transition year, we went to the board with a strategy and said, right, what does the future look like for us for the next three years? So we're currently in year three of a three-year strategy program. And the most obvious example of the change was the move to the Z brand uh, in that first year of that three-year program. What were you looking for? What was, what was, did you have an image in mind of the sort of service station operation that you were looking to create? I, I think it's fair to say most bosses do. So I had my own baggage that I brought to the table. But I think what was really distinctive about Z was we actually paused the whole company and said, look, we've got 99 years worth of history in New Zealand, but actually let's do some listening. So we did a, one of the largest pieces of research conducted in New Zealand for over a decade. And it was actually quite easy. A lot of people give us credit for what we've done, but all we really did was just listen to what people wanted, thought carefully about how we could deliver that, and then we just gone out there and executed reasonably well. Is there a lesson there that, that the more you invest potentially in the research, the better the outcome? Uh, yes and no. I, I think it's really important that you do invest in research because that's part of the listening. But I, I would never want anyone to think about us as a research-driven company. I think you have to package research and put it alongside intuition. I mean, I feel good about my nearly 30 years' worth of experience, and we've got a lot of experience inside Z. Mm -hmm. So I think you can, you can really win if you put intuition alongside research, because there are, there are some parts of our offer that the research didn't identify. In actual fact, some of the most popular parts of what we do, the research didn't tell us that. We actually put that together with our intuition and said, this looks like it's an unsaid so maybe there's an opportunity there for us, and that's actually how we piloted as well. So we tried some things, experimented, it worked out well, and then we rolled it out across the country. Let's come back to that, but let's first focus on what the research did tell you about what New Zealanders were looking for in the engagement process, I guess, with, with a service station. What, what, what were some of those key findings? Well, they're really simple things, actually. Uh, when it comes to the service station side of the business, uh, New Zealanders said, look, we have a really, I have a really busy day, so make it easy for me. So speed and service were the two things that came through very, very strongly on the service station experience. When it comes to the brand, uh, people said two simple things, actually. They said, look, I understand the Shell brand and I recognise it very clearly, but I have no emotional attachment to it. And the second thing they said was, how can you call yourself a Kiwi company if you've got that brand out front? So they said, look, we want to look for a contemporary identity. We want something that we can emotionally connect with as New Zealanders. And they actually said, even if you make mistakes, we'll give you a break as long as you, you give it a go and you're up front when you get it wrong. So how did you come up with Z? Uh, there was a lot of pizza and beer late at night that got to that point. Uh, but yeah, it, it really was just, yeah, what could we do? We had long names, short names. We then uh, narrowed some of those names down. We, we tested them. I have to say Z was one of the names that came up very early on. So there's a certain regret that why don't we just agree that in the first week. Uh, but yeah, you do have to go through a process and again, make sure you listen and learn. So uh, yeah, we had, all sorts, we had all sorts of names. And the thing about Z, we just thought it just really gets to the heart of the matter. Short, sharp, to the point. It is the world's shortest email address, and it only becomes a brand when you create meaning through consistent customer experience. On the day that I announced Z as a brand, all I really did was tell people about a new name, a new logo, and a new set of colours. It's over time through experience that it becomes a real brand. It's always intrigued me about the, the, the petrol uh, operation, is that you, know, you fill up your tank when you get to the closest petrol station. Do, do people actually, and what did the research tell you about the loyalty factor? I mean, do people go out of their way to go and search out a Z Energy station when they can see their tank getting low? Uh, yes and no. So a lot of us, when we think about the experience, and I know whether I work with business journalists like yourself or, or analysts in the market, so many of us bring our own experience to it and we judge it. But actually, our research said there are six types of customers in the marketplace. 
and they all have different needs, different wants, they're all driven by different things. So what we had to determine was who are our target segments, what offers do they best respond to. So in some cases people are loyal. So we have flybys on offer, about 50% of our transactions are associated with a flybys transaction and people are incredibly loyal to that. You know, 2.4 million cardholders across New Zealand. So there is an element of loyalty from that perspective. But equally, there are other people who say, look, just let, get me on, get me off as quick as you can. I just want to go to the nearest one when my, my petrol gauge tells me I need to fill up. And you know, our job is to make sure we understand those segments, where we can win relative to the competition, and how we can win for those customers that we're targeting. So what were some of those strategies that you've implemented that you said didn't come from the research? Well, believe it or not, one of the most uh, visible ones was the forecourt concierge. Mm. So it, it was never said, no one ever said to us, please put forecourt attendance people back on the forecourt to serve us. Uh, but it was unsaid and in the feedback that we're having, there was almost a, an, a hark back to the nostalgia of the good old days, mm. as much as people wanted to talk about the new things they were looking for around speed, the use of technology, etc. So that's, as I said, that's an example of where we put what the research told us explicitly or implicitly along with our intuition and and we experimented I think you know it's forgotten now but at the time we rolled out 10 pilot sites we put a brand up there we experimented with different offers and we were happy we would got it about right it's only then that we announced we would roll it out across the country it's always a challenge of course when you when you're rolling out a new strategy getting staff on board to buy into it so how did you go about the process of actually getting uh, all of your staff lined up behind the strategy? Well, pretty simple really. Uh, you might have heard about the X Factor. Well, we created the Z Factor program. And we first thing we did really was to get people to be untrained. Uh, our, our previous owners had really trained up our service station staff incredibly well, but they'd become robotic. They were automatic in what they did. So we had to unpack all of that, if you like. We had to take them back to ground zero. Uh, we had to really get them to be comfortable in being themselves. Uh, we told them why. We didn't tell them what we wanted them to do, we told them why, and we allowed them to generate what they would need to do to deliver on that why. So if we said we want to be distinctive as a Kiwi brand, we want to put speed and service back into our experience with customers because that's what they're asking for, what would that look like for you? What is your role in that? How would you go about doing that? What's getting in the way? We actually got them to generate into that paradigm rather than say, we've got it all worked out, now let us tell you as the bosses how to, how to deliver great service. Did you, did you look at some of New Zealand's experience and the way that they you know, d did a similar thing with, with telling their staff to, to effectively just, just act as natural New Zealanders rather than trying to be somebody that they, they weren't actually in fact? Yeah, we, we did a little bit. I think New Zealand ha is a very good example of uh, how to really create unique customer experiences and empower people in the front line. So there was something there. But equally, it's about how we train people. So we actually used uh, theatre sports or improvisation people to deliver the programme rather than get trainers to do it. And we made it a whole lot of fun because there's an incredible amount of diversity in our service station staff. I mean, the most obvious one is their cultural diversity, but there's quite a lot of uh, educational diversity there as well. There's some very, very qualified people as well as others who have sort of a minimum level of qualification. But everybody loves having fun. So taking that sort of improv theatre sports approach to the training of people uh, well actually I wouldn't even call it training, just freeing them up, mm -hmm. it was a really different approach to saying look here's a corporate video with a talking head mm -hmm. and here's the process you have to follow. And, and indeed uh, we didn't just do that for our service station staff, myself and my executive team went through the same whole day program mm -hmm. that we all of our two and a half thousand service station staff did. Has there been an opportunity to embrace technology within, within your business model? Uh, yeah, there has, uh, sort of at the corporate end of things. I mean, I write a blog every week. We have an intranet that everyone has access to. Uh, even yesterday, I shot a video blog. We came out of a strategy session, and one of our comms people sort of threw a camera in front of me and said, well, Mike, what have you been doing today, and what's strategy all about? So at the corporate end, that's what we do. Uh, we also shoot a lot of video with our, uh, for our service station staff. Uh, we've established an extranet for them so that they can actually connect with one another. And probably the best example is, is Facebook. Yeah, we are, I think, New Zealand's 14th or 15th largest Facebook site. 
Uh, we've got 160,000 fans on there. Uh, so yeah, we are very much reinforcing that listening aspect to our company. How do you offer career progression within within a business that that has a lot of operational staff, but I guess limited potential to actually you know rise up sort of through through management ranks? How do you approach that? Yeah, I, we're still learning how to do that. To be fair, there's been so much change inside the company in the last three years. I don't think we've had to confront that. There's been uh, new jobs created, new opportunities for people. We've expanded the number of sort of corporate jobs that we have. So that in itself created a marketplace for change uh, it's only now that we're sort of fronting up to well actually how do we help develop people uh, development doesn't always mean changing jobs sometimes it can mean project experiences and we do spend actually quite a lot of money on the personal development of our people because again from a listening organization perspective that's what they said that they want I think great companies today uh, establish a work environment where work is more closely experienced as personal development rather than just work and that's the philosophy that we have inside Z at all levels. Now one question I have to ask you because it's the one that, that motorists and everybody most like to want to hear an answer to. How do you decide on pricing of petrol? Because you're always accused of being uh, perhaps keen to put it up faster than, than put it down. How do you go about that decision making process day, day to day? Yeah, it, it's pretty simple actually. At the strategic level you say my job is to find the sweet spot between having happy shareholders, happy customers and unhappy competitors. So I've got to sort of create and maintain the tension between those three. So that's the, the broad context. Uh, within that, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, we operate on what we call a replacement cost basis. So we say whatever we bought it for, or could have bought it for yesterday, that determines today's price. And we simply look at what could we have bought it for yesterday, and we want to make sure that we have a, a healthy margin that makes us economically sustainable. We want to be competitive, and particularly when prices are high, we want to make sure we can do the best we can uh, for our customers. And it really is as, as simple as that. We just look at you know, what, what's today's input cost, what do we think is appropriate in the marketplace, and then we express that. I think people understandably question, well, isn't there collaboration, or indeed you know, aren't you breaking the law uh, in terms of how it plays out competitively? I think people really need to realise that we do face a very, very common cost base. You know, we all buy oil on the international markets, we ship it here, we process it locally. So when people see about, say, $2.20 at the pump, you know, our gross margin on that's about 20 cents or our net profit's about two. So that means that all those other costs are very, very common to everybody else. And that really is why you just don't see these massive differences in price. It's simply because uh, we all have a very, very similar input cost base. And therefore, really, the basis is simply to use the petrol fill up as the hook, and the idea is you kind of upsell other products while while you're there. That's why we've seen this this quite dramatic change in the way service stations have become convenience stores almost. Yeah, I, I put it another way, actually, I think I think people again need to realise that if we didn't sell convenience to people, the service station business on its own is is not economic. Or put another way, prices on petrol would need to be higher. Uh, so the way that works is if you think about you've already got a labour and a property overhead on a service station, therefore if you can sell something out of the store it doesn't really cost you that much more uh, to do that. Uh, having said that, in terms of our business, uh, we were uh, not fulfilling on the potential that we had. We're New Zealand's third largest retailer. So we have 60 million people a year coming across our forecourts and to be honest we just weren't selling them enough from our perspective or more importantly we weren't taking the hassle factor out of their busy day. So if they're buying a coffee somewhere why don't they buy it from us? Right? And we, the fact is we didn't have a very good offer. So that's what we try to do is, is sort of our speed, service and, and hassle free is what we're about. People don't love coming to service stations so we want to make sure that they can do more than one thing when they do visit. It is speed because you, you also suffer the dilemma that every, for the longer somebody sits outside on the forecourt with their car parked in front of a pump, that denies you the ability to push another customer through. So you're both wanting to engage them and get them spending as much as they can, but, but it really is about doing that as quickly as possible, isn't it? Yeah, for some customers, uh, yeah, there are some who just wouldn't even want to come anywhere near the store. They'd love to be able to uh, drive on into the nearest lane, fill up at the pump, transact there immediately through you know, some card reader and then get on their way. And we've got some offers we're piloting to provide that to those types of people. There are others, once they're in the store, they don't want to join a long queue uh, of people. So for example, we've spent $12 million completely replacing our point of sale, and we've sped up transaction times. We've taken uh, about 10 seconds out of the transaction. That doesn't sound a lot, but if you multiply that by 60 million transactions, we're actually talking about years worth of productivity, if you like, we've released into the New Zealand market because people aren't standing uh, in a queue for one or two minutes to, to buy their petrol. Mm -hmm.
How do you achieve growth in a business like Z Energy where, you know, every spot that needs a service station probably just about has one right now and as you say it's intensely competitive so how, how do you actually grow beyond what you have at the moment? Uh, two aspects to that one is clearly we can grow our non-fuel income and I think that's pretty evident by what we're doing in the store uh, we've invested in, in car washes uh, for example uh, we talk to people like the fast food chains who may want to co-locate on a, on a site where we have additional space available uh, when it comes to the, the fuel volume uh, itself, yeah, we don't, there are two ways of doing that, either build new facilities, and there are changing demographics or roading changes that, that provide us with opportunities. Uh, so we plan to build about seven new service stations in this next financial year because of those roading changes. Uh, two of those have already opened up. And then you come back to your existing business and say, well, actually, if people are visiting, visiting us, say, three times out of five, what would it take to get them to come to us four times out of five? And that's when you come back to branding, service, speed, all the other parts of our offer, so that people maybe, not everyone, but some might say, actually, I'll just go slightly out of my way to go to Z, or I'll make sure I fill up before my tank gets on empty by going to my favourite Z service station. Could you also look at technology options where you develop an app, for instance, and if I know I'm, I want to pick up a subway or something as part of it, you can pre-order that so it's ready, and all of those, again, playing into the convenience model? Uh, absolutely. We're doing some experimentation there, uh, partly through our relationship with Flybys, uh, we've got an electronic collector card for our coffee sales and there's a couple other things that we're working on as well that I, that I can't disclose at this point in time that again it all goes back to that speed and service that customers are looking for. How competitive is the space? How much are you keeping an eye on your competitors as well too? Well I, I wouldn't be arrogant in saying look we've got the whole thing licked and we know what we're doing. I, I think it's really important for us to realise we're competing against some of the world's largest companies. Uh, the people across the road that we compete with are very very good at what they do. I mean, let's face it, I used to work for one of them for the bulk of my career. So, yeah, very, very talented people. So, uh, so a little bit just like the All Blacks, we've got to think about if we want to win the game, what are the strengths that we have and or how can we exploit the weaknesses or the limitations of our competitors? And, and that's essentially what we do. We play to our strengths and we try to take advantage of what our competitors perhaps aren't so good at. A couple of things would be yeah, their, their willingness to invest capital in this market. They frankly have got better alternatives elsewhere in the world. And it comes down to their nimbleness. Yeah, we can listen to a customer and change it this afternoon, whereas perhaps in, in their business models they need to either implement a global solution to things or perhaps seek authority from outside of the country. How much has being a listed company changed the, the management dynamics? And for instance, have you got staff that have now got shares in the company? Is that, has that changed that dynamic, for instance? Yeah, it has. Uh, we, uh, we put into the prospectus that we would be making uh, an offer around an employee uh, share plan. I mean, many large companies do that and we'll be executing that very shortly. But I think perhaps more importantly, even though our staff knew that, of the sort of 290-odd corporate staff that we had, uh, 83 of them decided to invest as part of the IPO process itself, completely outside of uh, the employee plan. Uh, they all, all invested almost a million dollars. So some of the feedback we've had is that uh, from people who know these things better than I do was, while that's a surprisingly high level of penetration if you think you know sort of a quarter to a third of your staff invested outside of the employee program. Particularly because many of your staff are not on necessarily high income rates. Yeah that, that, that's right so yeah, there was a range of investment levels so I think what I feel really good about is standing up at an AGM when we have that next year and saying to our shareholders well yeah my interests are aligned with yours and there's at least 83 other people in Z who invested outside of the the employee program whose interests are equally aligned with yours. Where, where will you see the company in five years' time? What, what, are, you, what are you driving towards, if you forgive the pun? Uh, yeah, um, I've got to be careful what I say about that, given that we've got an offer document out there, etc. Et, et, et so if I sort of talk more thematically, I mean, very clearly we're, we're here to stay. Uh, we want to make sure that we embed ourselves within the New Zealand uh, community, uh, both at a community level at service station, but equally within the business community. Uh, we want to have a brand that, that really means something for, for New Zealanders. Uh, we want to make sure we're generating economically sustainable returns, uh, both for our shareholders, but also to encourage us to keep making the investments in infrastructure uh, that New Zealand needs. And I can assure you we'll still be focused on listening uh, to our customers, because ultimately that's what we have to do, and that's all wrapped up in, uh, if you like, a blanket called safety. We have to have safe and reliable operations. Uh, we do sell hazardous materials. We have a long supply chain, so we have to make sure that we're on the button around health and safety all of the time.